This is flipped mini lecture number 34. We're going to cover night 12.8 and 12.9. 12.8 is on the subject of statics. 12.9 is on the subject of rolling motion. Now, the lovely thing for you is there's really not any new theory in these two sections. These two sections are applications of all the theory you've learned prior in chapter 12. And so because there isn't any new theory, a good way for me to cover it is actually just to do two problems. These, are, these sections are in applications. Why don't I show you a couple problems to show you how these kinds of applications work? So the first problem is number 59 on page 333. And this is an example of the subject of statics. And what you've got on this problem is a construction worker who's at a distance D1 from the wall. And then there's uh, the total length of the beam is D1 plus D2 because the end of the beam is a little bit further. And then it's not the wall right here. It's not this part of the wall that's keeping this beam from falling down. It's this cable right here. And that cable forms an angle theta relative to the beam. And the question of the problem is, what is the tension, capital T, in terms of all these other things, the mass of the worker, the mass of the beam, d1, d2, theta, and of course, g, the acceleration of gravity. So here's what you got to do to do this kind of problem. In general, in statics problems, uh, the old kind of statics problems that you had, what you said was, oh, if an object isn't accelerating, the sum of all the forces on the object if it isn't accelerating, must be zero. Now, here, with now thanks to all these powerful new tools that we have at our disposal, we can say if an object doesn't have any angular acceleration, then the torques, the sum of all the torques on an object must be zero. So statics with these new tools is very much like statics with the tools that you already had. Let's sum up all the torques on this beam. You see this worker out here? This worker it is a distance D1 from the wall. If we're going to, let's take this as the point about which we're resolving all of our torques. So we have that point there. This point here where the worker's sitting is D1 away from that. The torque due to the worker sitting there, well, that torque is, that worker is trying to push down with a force of MWG, and it's happening at a distance D1. The MWG of the worker is straight down, and this vector that goes from this position to where that force is being applied is straight right. And you know how there's a sign of an angle in this torque formula? Well, here it would be 90 degrees because straight down and straight right are 90 degrees from each other, so there's no sign in this one. So the torque has that contribution to it, and it's in there with a minus sign because this one's tending to spin the beam in what we usually call the uh, minus um, direction, clockwise. Okay, now there's another torque, which is the weight of the beam itself. So the beam weighs mb. So the beam has a force down on it of mbg. And you might go, well, shoot, where is that force acting? Because gravity's tugging on this portion of the beam, and 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 this portion, and this portion, and this portion. Every molecule in that beam is being pulled down, and the force of gravity is distributed all across that beam. 
But if you'll remember, I told you about calculating the center of mass of an object is the exact same thing as calculating the center of gravity of an object. And the upshot of all that is, is that if you have an evenly distributed bunch of mass along a beam, it is as if the gravity was all concentrated at the center of the beam. Okay, so this is, if this is concentrated at the center of the beam and the total length of the beam is d1 plus d2, then this torque acts as if it were at d1 plus d2 over 2, which is how far away the center is from the pivot point. And again, this is in the minus direction. Okay, so we've accounted for both of the uh, downward torques. Now we got to count for this thing here. The tension on this cable is also causing a torque. Now, if this cable were pointed straight up, it would be capital T times D1 plus D2. But this cable isn't pointed straight up. The component of the force, which is tangential, that is perpendicular to the end of the beam, but uh, tangential to the direction that this thing would be trying to torque the beam. So the component of the force in the tangential direction, it has a capital T and a sine of theta in it. So there's our formula for the sum of all the torques on this beam. And unless we want this beam to be accelerating, like being pulled too hard, in which case it would go whoop, or being pulled too weakly, in which case it would go whoop, uh, unless we want this uh, beam's uh, angular acceleration to be something, it better be zero. So we set all those things equal to zero. So this is the uh, sum of the torques set equal to zero. Now, uh, you can see this thing involves one of the givens, D1, another one of the givens, the mass of the worker, another one of the givens would be always the gravitational constant, G, mass of the beam, uh, what D1 was already mentioned, there's D2. Uh, D1, D2, and theta are given, so you can clearly solve this entire thing for T. And I'm not going to do that algebra, it's trivial. Solve this thing for T, plug in the numbers, you'll get the answer to number 59 on page 333. And that's about all I'm going to show you on statics. Now let's do an example that illustrates 12.9. 12.9 is on rolling motion. Rolling motion often involves needing to know the kinetic energy or the angular momentum of a like spinning pulley or a spinning wheel or something like that. Um, so here we have a spinning wheel, which we're not going to neglect the mass of. We're going to say that's mass of the pulley, and it's got a radius r. And here, initially, we have a situation where we have a big mass, m sub b, which is h off the ground. And then we have a little mass, uh, m sub small, which is currently sitting on the ground. And let me just ask a question, which is not actually the question that was asked in number 86 on 335. Let me ask, how fast is mb going? when it hits the ground. The way I'm going to handle that is as a conservation of energy problem. So if you call this the initial situation, and this thing is start, all started out at rest, none of these have any kinetic energy. But we do see we have some height here in potential energy, which as this mass goes down by h, this one is going to go up by h. So we see that uh, the big mass, m sub b, is going to have a change in gravitational potential energy of uh, m b g delta y. And in this case, 
uh, its delta y is going to be minus h. Meanwhile, this one has a change in gravitational potential energy, which is ms g times its delta y. Well, it's going up, so its delta y is plus h. So when this one goes down by h and this one goes up by h, that's how much uh, the change in the potential energy is. And this must be equal to minus the change in the kinetic energy of the system, if we're assuming everything's frictionless and nothing is kind of lost to that kind of problem. Now, the next thing we can ask ourselves is, well, what is the total kinetic energy of this system when m sub b hits the ground? Well, m sub b is gonna hit the ground with some speed. Let's call that speed v. And its kinetic energy when it hits the ground is therefore 1 half mb v squared. Now thanks to this pulley situation, if this one's going down at speed vb, at speed v, this one's going up at speed, the same speed. So I don't need to say that there's a vb or a vs because in magnitude they're the same. So we know that when this one hits the ground with speed v, this one is actually going up with speed v, so its kinetic energy is 1 half msv squared. And then the only thing we have to figure out then is what is the kinetic energy of this wheel which has mass m pulley. Okay, so now what? how do we do that? Well, we know that that's 1 half i omega squared. And I, for a disk of mass mp and radius r, is uh, 1 half mp r squared. Now, we've got too many unknowns here. And why do we have too many unknowns? Well, because omega and v are related. If this thing is going down with speed v, that's because this wheel is turning. And uh, what we have here for the, for the amount of this, the cable is passing by here, we have that the velocity of the cable that's passing by, which is V, because that same cable is attached to MB, is equal to omega times capital R. Because this is the angular frequency speed of the uh, pulley, and this is the radius of the pulley, and we know that the, that the relationship between uh, tangential velocity and angular velocity and radius is that. So that means that right here we have omega squared. We can substitute, we can solve this thing here for omega, and then we get v over r squared. So now, that's kind of nice. You see that r squared there? That canceled that r squared there. So let's sum up. What do we got? We know that the uh, total amount of energy uh, released is equal to this. We know that uh, that is equal to, with a minus sign, the change in the kinetic energy. So we take the uh, one giant red box uh, we put a minus sign in front of it and equate it to the other giant red box and we get a formula. Well, I did it. I put in the uh, two things we had down there into a formula and you can see now that it's actually pretty easy to uh, take this and solve for V. You get V is equal to, uh, the two comes to the other side, the MBG, so that's what I get for how fast this thing's going when it hit. Now, actually, if you go back and look at uh, number 86 on 335, they asked you, uh, how long does it take to hit? And you know, of course, this speed went from zero to V uh, in a nice linear way, right? T wide and V high, um, then we have one half, T times the final V is equal to H. 
because the area under this curve, which is the velocity as a function of time, must be the distance traveled. And the area under this curve is 1 half times the width t times the final height v. So you have 1 half t v equals h. So you have, uh, you have t is equal to 2h over v, where v is what you got in that step. So actually, if you want to answer the question that was actually asked in number 86 on 335, which is how long does it take the big mass to hit the ground, you punch in for that, and then you punch in for that, and you'd have your answer. Okay, that covers 12.8 and 12.9.